Space-themed seafood restaurants. Last season we did those, that Crab Shack thing, I love that. Like, you know, Maine coastal seafood comes to Manhattan, that was fun. But this season, serious seafood. And, you know, leading the way, you got Bernanette, one of the best seafood restaurants in America, maybe the best. But today we're going to visit a couple of other of my favorites. I love Pastor Nakadeska, but we're not doing him this season. We're going to go to Sea Grill here in Rockefeller Center. Ed Brown, old school pro, I love this guy. Been doing seafood for years, he's cooked everywhere, three stars Paris. All over New York, the guy knows seafood. And this is a great location. Wintertime, you got the tree here, you got the rink. In the summer, you're eating outdoors. Rockefeller Center is beautiful. Next stop is going to be Oceana. Cornelius Gallagher, whiz kid. Good looking young chef, cooks his brains out, and I love him. And New York's got this great seafood connection. I mean, we're surrounded by water, right? Manhattan's an island. So, seafood, New York. First stop, Sea Grill. First stop, Oceana, one of Manhattan's top seafood eateries, where we're going to meet Chef Cornelius Gallagher. This kid is young and handsome. I can't stand him. He's skinny, too, and he's got an amazing resume. We'll let him tell that story. We're here in the dining room of Oceana with Cornelius Gallagher, one of these young Turks in the business, man. How old are you now? I am 33, almost 34. And you've been here for how long? I've been here for almost four years, just under four years, I guess. So you came here, you're a 29, 30-year-old oh, guy. Exactly. Taken over. Rick Moon had left. Place mm -hmm. had three stars. Yes. Where were you before this? Before I was at Oceana, uh, I was at Danielle. I was sous chef at Danielle for a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was at Lespinas. I was at Lespinas for a year and a half with Grey Kunz. Uh, I'd also uh, done three months in France at Marc Monod, mm -hmm. L'Esperance, three-star mm -hmm. Michelin. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I was at uh, Peacock Alley with Laurent Gras for a year and a half, his, his sous chef. Uh, before that, uh, I was a chef on Long Island for one year when I was very young uh, at a place called La Plage, a 40-seat French restaurant on the water. And before that, I was a uh, line cook, a poissonnier at the Old Boulet. One of the fish cooks, I should Ooh, say. That's a great resume. Before that, you were 14, so don't Before go that, I was, yeah. <laughs> Keep subtracting years, you're going to be cooking in diapers. I was a zygote on the line cooking really this small. This is the sashimi of red and white uh, tuna. So on top, this is hamachi. On the bottom, this is the, uh, the bluefin tuna. Number one bluefin from Japan. So you realized early on that you were only as good as your own technique. You're only as good as what you're exposed to, yeah. I think. And yeah. I always wanted to right. surround myself with people that were better than me, and I wanted to learn. And uh, I try to do that even today with the management that I have, the people that I hire in the kitchen. I always try to absorb what they have, learn from them, but always surround myself, as I said, with my resume coming up through the ranks, with people who are better than me and work for chefs who I thought were way better than me. This is the Canadian hard shell lobster. It's a fresh rocket. Underneath is a mutsu apple puree. And then there's uh, paysan vegetables of, uh, of leek and celery root. And then this is a, a sep and vermouth emulsion that gets kind of drizzled over the top. For each chef, I went for specific reasons. I went to Boulay to learn how to cook a la minute, last minute food. Uh, I went to uh, Grey Kunz, uh, Les, Les Benas, to learn how to cook with spices, Indian and Asian spices. Uh, I went to work with Laurent Gras to learn razor sharp French technique. I mean, making sauces a la minute. Uh, and I went to work with, uh, with Danielle to learn how to turn a profit in a high-end restaurant and how to be a true chef slash businessman, owner. Right. owner. Yeah. And also in between, I also went to El Bulli, did a brief stage at El Bulli, uh, and that exposed me to the kind of molecular gastronomy type of, uh, of cooking, so it was very interesting. That's gorgeous. Gracias, senor. In terms of the process, how are you putting together plates? Again, thinking of... It, it's, it sounds a little wacky, like if I'm putting together a plate, the first thing I'm thinking about is flavor, is I want to create a dish that I could sit down and I could eat over and over again, and not not get bored of it, but be interested to eat it a second time. I like in each dish there to be contrast of textures and of flavors, and to hit all different parts of the tongue, the salt, the bitter, the sour, the sweet, the crunch, the, the soft, all different textures, mm. everything. I want it to be like uh, little different things going on. Very exciting. This is uh, Australian swordfish. Very clean flesh. It's uh, roasted, basted with butter, thyme, and shallots. This is a uh, red endive, glazed in blood orange juice. So it's bitter and tangy at the same time. So it's kind of like walking that fine line where you want to do something that's innovative and interesting, but at the same time, something that's extremely tasty. So the first thing I look at is the flavor of the dish. Then I'll look at originality. How can I tweak the dish and do it in a way that I think that maybe other people have not seen it before. Mm. Of course I use my environment to inspire me, 
But I also look at other things. I don't just look at cooking. Uh, I'm inspired a lot by a, there's a Scottish nature artist by the name of Andy Goldsworthy. He goes to these locales around the world. He'll live in the woods for two days, and then he'll use no tools. He'll take his bare hands, he'll take rocks, and he'll start cutting twigs and leaves. And after about a day, he'll come up with these beautiful works of art that are created out of nature, mm. purely natural. And then the elements take them away. The rain, the wind, they go back to nature. It's pretty much the same thing we're doing in the restaurant. We're creating mm -hmm. mini works of art, and they're returning to nature. So it's the same process, I think. Like the wind put it on the plate, you know? Yes. You know, this is sort of a theme now, because people do talk local, 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 and that's great. We do have local fish. I mean, between the New Bedford Sound and, and you know, the shoals in Virginia, there's great fish. But the whole world's shrunk for this availability now. I mean, you can get stuff FedEx from anywhere almost. Absolutely. So that's something you've been taking advantage of. Especially if you're in New York, if you're a chef in New York, there's yeah. no excuse not to have top quality uh, ingredients, whether it be produce, fish, meat, anything. Uh, this, is, this is the hub of the world for me, and it's the most exciting place in the world to cook. And if you can't get good product here, you seriously have problems or you don't want to pay for it. We pay top dollar for our stuff, so. Now we're off to Sea Grill where we'll meet Chef Ed Brown. Ed's been on the New York scene for years. I've known this guy for a long time. Great long New York resume, worked at some fantastic New York restaurants, and he's been the go-to guy for restaurant associates for a long time. Seasoned pro, cookbook author for fish, really well respected in the industry. You'll see. I've really kind of grown up, you know. Uh, I look for every possible turn away to put less things on the plate. Yeah. I look to find, I spend a lot of time in procurement. I want to find the ingredients with the best salt and the best oil, and I want to execute it perfectly, and I can stand out there just by myself. You know, it's, it's as if you made a beautiful sculpture, you wouldn't start hanging, you know, wreaths off of it or, or bells. It stands by itself. And this is a Dover sole. This is Brittany Dover sole uh, with cockles and chorizo and sweet main shrimp. Little spice. It smells great. Paring things down and making it about what it's supposed to be. If it's supposed to be about bass, when it comes to the table, it reads bass, it tastes bass, it is bass. And there's some nice things there, a little soft bar, whatever, but it's about the bass. I'm not big on, you know, chemical use or, uh, you know, and I think that's good. I see a lot of foam and dots today. Right. A couple of dots, not A couple of foam. dots, and we use some foam sometimes, right. but... Uh, when it's appropriate and I really appreciate what some of these guys are doing because them moving forward by the time that shakes out will be something of, something of, of a lot of value. It's just I think that's the generation right after me though. The molecular cooking style. Right. That's a beautiful piece of cod. Oh yeah. You know when fish starts to get old and this happens with cod like within 24 hours and gets worse and worse all of these pieces start to flake apart in the raw fish as the proteins degenerate. This is just firm. It's absolutely pristine, fresh fish, perfectly held together. And then when you cook it, it'll begin to flake. But when it's in its raw state, this is exactly what it should look like. And that's just a gorgeous center cut right off the loin. You were one of the first guys, I think, really to bring a poncha in, in, into the, to a New York kitchen as just part of your regular line. Where'd you get the idea? I was on a trip in Spain, and everywhere I went, I saw plancha. From a little simple restaurant to some of the most famous three-star restaurants in uh, San Sebastian, like uh, Arsac and Martin Barres Ategui, all using plancha. I'm like, it's, something must be right here. And basically, it's just a griddle. And in America, we think that a griddle is for cooking pancakes. And browns right. and bacon in the morning. And what it is, it just allows to give you a perfect cooking. And then we're just toasting the fish instead of singeing the flesh. So you taste fish that's lightly caramelized instead of singed, and all you taste is that singed flavor. I begged and I pleaded, and I got a piece of the scorpion fish you're serving off the menu today because it looks so freaking good. This is off the plancha. You know, when fish is good, it needs so little help. A little salt, a touch of pepper, and you can't see how it's cooked. It's just perfect. And that plancha is just great because it doesn't beat the fish up. This fish is just cooked perfectly through, 
au point. It's delicious. You know, this was something I saw in the kitchen. I had to grab Thai basil, Thai red chili sauce down the bottom. But I'm going to dig into one of these razor clams and dip it. Is this good or what? Dip it down into that chili sauce. Mmm. That's beautiful. These clams are great. Sometimes you see these on the shell, Jersey. Never got them fresh. These restaurants get them. They're wonderful. Home cooks really struggle with fish. I mean, I do some cooking classes here in the city, and one of the classes I do is fish cooking, and people are just baffled by it. Everyone's like, what would be some of your advice for people at home to try and prepare fish that's just, you know, basic across the board? First thing is, you know, all of those things you've heard about, about buying fish. Yeah, that's where it starts. You know, make people confused. You know, there's a couple of general rules. I think the biggest rule is go to a busy fish market in your neighborhood uh, where people you know buy fish, and if it's not good, they're going to see you again. It's going to be a problem. And don't be afraid to ask the guy, and you have to speak up and be a little bit aggressive and say, you know, what's good, what's not good, that looks interesting, that doesn't look like it's as nice, it looks a little dull-colored or milky, and, right. you, you know, right. look for... Look, great fish, it sounds simple, great fish does look good, and fish is not as good, looks less nice. When the proteins are set, it looks like jello. It's right. wiggly, it's solid, right. there's no breakage. It's translucent, it's yeah. not extremely wet. Yeah, it doesn't have to get that white milky that's been in ice right. a couple of days too right. many. It's not been, you know, it's not been soaked in tripolyphosphates or anything like that. <laughs> and yeah. the other thing is that I tell all, all, all first time fish cooks, especially the ones who say, well, oh, I don't want my house to smell like fish. I said, do, do this. Buy either halibut or fluke or flounder, something like that medium-sized piece, not too thick, take it home, in a pan, some diced shallots, a little fresh thyme, a squeeze of lemon, a tablespoon of butter, and a half a cup of water. Bring it to a simmer, put the fish in there, cook it two minutes on one side, two minutes on the other side, turn the fire down, take the fish out and let it rest, reduce the liquid, pour it over the fish. You're gonna, have the, you're gonna love cooking fish at home, and you're gonna have accomplished cooking fish at home, and your family's gonna love it. My kids eat that almost every Sunday, by the way. Just that. No kidding. Just like that. That's great. Any fish that you've come across that are relatively new to you that are exciting lately? New? The newest fish I've seen recently is the barramundi, the Australian barramundi, which is coming wild and farmed. Um, but uh, that's, probably, that's probably the only new fish I've seen in a long time. I mean, I see a lot of fish. But, you know, uh, a point worth noting that's goes back to the fact that we're really depleting the supply of uh, fish food in the ocean. And uh, people need to be aware of our conservation. It's not about, I'd like to be green. It's about, you better be, or yeah. you're not gonna eat fish. Yeah, we're just gonna be farm raised. You're not gonna years. be there. Yeah. And for the same token, get behind sustainable farm raised fish, because at some point, even if we do conserve, we're gonna need it. So we better get behind it and do it right now. Did you stand right here? You guys have been with me on here before. We're at the docks here, Cold Spring, down by Cape May. This is a scallop boat. It's been out for about a week. Actually, seven hours, seven, seven, seven days and 26 minutes or something. It's on the computer, they told me. But scallops are in those bags, and these are, if you could shoot these, these are huge. These are U-10s. They're not all this big. This is a seven-day voyage, but that means there's 10 of these to the pound. So you do the math. Almost two ounces apiece. These are monsters. Um, you know, Ed Brown talked about seafood and seafood farming and where it's going to go. Well, this is this scallops is one of the great success stories for species management here. Scallop crops are healthy. Scallops are all up and down this section of the East Coast from here up up to George's Bank and down to the Carolinas, and they're doing beautifully. So, talk to the captain, get the scoop, and they got some monkfish on there as a bycatch. So I'm grabbing one of them. That, that could be dinner. You left from here from Cold Spring. Left from Cold Spring. I went offshore to about. I have made about 80 or 90 miles right offshore. Okay, and then you're hitting what? You know where the scallop beds are, you just know historically well, where to just, find them? It's just the instinct that all fish will have. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> so you drop this thing down, you start dredging. How deep How deep do you go to pull these scallops up? Well, we worked in 30 fathom water, which is uh, six times 30, that's 180 feet. 180 feet, okay. Yeah. All right, now, you've been scallop fishing for how long? Uh, I estimate about 19, 20 years. Okay, the scallop beds now seem to be pretty darn healthy, aren't they? 
To me, they, yeah. I mean, it seems that way. Everybody, I'm you've raised the size of the rings. You're getting bigger scallops all the time. Yeah. Giving them time to reproduce. Exactly. And it seems like there's been scallop catches are up every year. Every year, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nice big raw scallop. Like candy. Come on. Good. Like candy. Huh? When they're fresh, they're good. Raw. They're unbelievable. Delicious. Why cook them? Eh, I'm eating a raw scallop. This is one of those um, survivor shows, okay? These things are beautiful. All right. Oceana, Sea Grill. You know, Manhattan now has great, great, great seafood restaurants. I mean, thanks to Bernardin years ago, a lot of guys have trained all around the city, and, and you know, Esca, what Dave Pasternak's doing, um, Cornelius at Oceana, Ed. I mean, these guys are just seasoned vets. Beautiful stuff. But what it all comes down to with seafood is it's got to be fresh, period. You got lousy fish, goes in the trash can. Good chefs can't do anything with it. And, you know, we're lucky in this market you can get great, great fish, and I'm spoiled rotten. But I can walk out in the back of a boat and pull this stuff off. So what we have is what we saw. We have the monkfish tail, came off that scallop boat. Um, you've seen monkfish. We had a monkfish in the Danielle show. The head's about, this is the, literally the, the bottom third of the fish. The first two-thirds is this enormous head uh, that they just throw overboard. And these scallops, which we saw. So what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something with scallops and monkfish. I mean, these things are just gorgeous. Big, firm, tight. Well, you saw me. I, made, I ate one raw. I'm not nuts. It was, it was actually very good. So I want to pair monkfish. I, I must have had this somewhere because I do this a lot. Monkfish with cabbage. Cabbage is crunchy. It's got a great sort of, you know, earthy flavor. I just like it with monkfish because monkfish has that sort of lobster tail-like quality to it. They often, and I'm, I'm sure I, I had this somewhere and I just said, I'm going to do that at home because I've been doing it ever since. So I'm just going to saute cabbage, a little water in the cabbage, knock it down a little bit, maybe a little onion to begin with. Black mustard seeds, just for some texture and a little flavor. A little bowl of that, some monkfish, a scallop next to it, and probably a big piece of toast. And just keep it really simple. Because when seafood's great, I don't think you need sauces. You don't need fancy preparations. This stuff is great on its own. So, you know, it doesn't need makeup in a dress. So, let's, let's take this thing down. Scallops are easy to do. Let's, let's do the monkfish. Take it off of my pizza tray. This is just this membrane that comes off. You'll see. It looks ugly now, but when we're done, it'll be beautiful. Years ago, this was a real junk fish. But these days, everybody's eating it because it's good. Now, there's two fillets. They run right down along this line. And this is what you're used to seeing when you go to the market. Now we'll trim all this membrane off. And pretty soon, you'll recognize it for what you see in the stores. All right, clean off my cutting board, but here's my two cleaned, skinned monkfish tails. Oh, how did I miss that? That's it, looking beautiful. <sighs> they smell like the ocean. I mean, these just, my hands after cutting these, just smells like salt water. Just clean like the ocean. Like if you close your eyes, you can hear the seagulls. That's beautiful stuff. Um, we don't need much of it. A couple of scallops, and we know how to do those things. These are just massive scallops. Again, they're figuring about 10 to the pound. This is just Savoy cabbage. And again, I'm doing this because it's crunchy, it's easy, I like it, and I'm sure I must have had this somewhere once. And I thought, yeah, that works. Nice stuff, it's got a good flavor. It'll just cut it in kind of shreds here. This will saute down to Nothing once it starts to wilt. That's enough. Half a head. Let's start with the cabbage because that's what's going to take the longer of the two. Get a pan hot here. We'll start with a little onion here. I snuck this in because I didn't want to saute plain cabbage. Just give it a little flavor base. Once these sweat down a little, add the mustard seeds. And I'm not going to cook these too far because I don't want them burning, so just let these start to wilt. They'll cook with the cabbage. The cabbage is going to take some time. Throw in some mustard seed. And the cabbage. Another 
splash of oil. And this will probably take uh, 10 minutes, 8 to 10 minutes. We're going to add some water along the way to coax it along. But first, let's let these wilt a little. I'm just putting water in because this is a co now I'm using a combination of sauteing and steam heat. Just really pushes the cooking. I like to do this with vegetables sometimes. Rather than adding more grease and turning, just let a little, get some steam involved, pushes them along. Oops. All right, now I know this pan's mad hot. Season that monkfish and stand back. This is pan roasting. Something about cabbage and butter. All right, we added a good tablespoon or so of butter to this now. Just get all that cooking liquid and reduce it and bind it. Perfect. Nice color. And that's, a, that's a dry scallop. Isn't that pretty? Once I take these out of the pan, I'm going to let them sit for a couple of minutes too, just to compose, because they're hot on the outside, they're still cool, that heat's still going in. So I'll take them out just a little bit ahead of time, let temperatures even out outside to inside, and then we'll plate them up and see what they look like. We'll cut them. We know the scallops don't take long, and then with those we can eat. Nice shiny cabbage. Just take one of these guys and we'll just shingle it a little. Put a little brown butter across the top of that from the pan. And let's just open that up and I mean that's about this is can you see the light in there? Mm -hmm. I mean that's about perfect. Nice and moist. It's a beautiful piece of fish. And the scallop just set here like this. Another one the same way. Just shingle them a little. A couple drops of lemon juice. You know, again, with great seafood, just keep it really simple. If it's this fresh, it doesn't need, doesn't need fancy stuff, it doesn't need sauces, it doesn't need anything. I mean, again, this scallop is just, well, I eat one of those raw, so who's kidding who? Got nice color. Sweet as can be. Tastes like the ocean. Tastes better than the ocean. And the monk, just set. This is wonderful. Firm. You could drizzle a little more butter if you wanted to, a little brown butter. Great tasting fish. Great texture. That firm tail. I mean, I think that's why people sort of say it's like lobster. And cabbage, I don't know. Again, I must have had this some, somewhere once. I just thought it worked, so I've been doing it ever since. I ripped somebody off. Mm -hmm. Kind of the meatiness of this plays off that. Nice piece of bread. Sullivan Street Bakery. Can't go wrong. Like everybody says with seafood, keep it simple. And I do keep it simple. No fancy sauces, no big reductions, no foam, no dots. No. Fresh fish in the pan, out of the pan before it's overcooked. We just missing a nice big glass of white wine, but we're filming all day and it's too early for that. So, eat seafood, eat it more often, learn how to cook it, be comfortable with it. Until next time, eat well often.